So uh, our title is the uh, casually named construction of high performance virtual machines for dynamic languages. You'll know I'm actually going to read my title to that memorable. Um, and doing that, I produced a virtual machine called Hot Eye, which I gave talks on near Python last year and the year before. Um, as an experimental virtual machine for Python, experimental with res optimization techniques and the exercise engagement is more to do with how to engineer those techniques, how to build things that actually implement the techniques from it, rather than the techniques themselves, which are broadly similar to what Python does. So I'm not claiming any originality on the fundamental algorithms here. Um, I'm interested in just about anything to do with virtual machines, but particularly dynamic languages and you know which dynamic language. Right, this talk. I'm going to uh, mention what C Python is, just a chance to come to it for some reason. <laughs> Why it's important, likewise. Um, then we get into the more technical stuff, tracing, what it is and how it works. Um, the problems with tracing Python, or simply try the problems with tracing C Python anyway. And we'll look at how to solve those problems. Um, I'll go through how you optimize the traces that you produce from tracing. And if we, depending on how much time we've got, there's a whole bunch of other issues that are more to do with not the fundamentals of the optimizations, but how to actually do it in C Python. The C Python obviously wasn't designed to do this sort of stuff from the start, and then we'll conclude. Okay, so C Python virtual machine. You probably all know this. Uh, it's quite old, uh, and it's involved with the Python language. So. It really wasn't designed to implement, to implement the Python we use today. Um, when it was first built, Python didn't have, well, a lot of stuff. You know, anyone remember like Python 1 point whatever? I mean, I never used it. So <laughs> if you get a few hands up at the back, so you know what it's like, it's a very different language. Um, like things like descriptors, which are very important to the way the language works, just weren't in the language. So they kind of, things like that have sort of bolted on a bit, so. So I want to bring C Python into the 21st century, because it's kind of still in the 1980s, really. But it's very important, no change in language. I mean, that's the absolute fundamental thing. And this is the slightly harder one, no change to C API. Right, why do you use C Python? Why do you use PyPy? PyPy's fast, didn't want to go to PyPy talk? Yeah. Right, well, those who did probably won't be convincing that Python can be made fast. PyPy's demonstrated that. But point by it can't be embedded, or at least not yet. It doesn't support the extensions well. There's a whole bunch of reasons. And, and yeah, C Python is widely used, it just has a huge amount of inertia and momentum. It runs on many platforms. PyPy again. A lot of these things, you know, quite these are all goals for PyPy support, but it, it doesn't yet, and no. So C Python is important still. Right. What is tracing? Now all optimizations are based around tracing. So we have to know what tracing is. Tracing, like pretty much every term in computer science, has at least four different meanings. So in this context, tracing is basically following the execution of a program. But particularly in the case of a bytecode interpreter, it's following the execution of the bytecodes. So in a tracing interpreter, we run through the program, functions are called, return, and so on. And there are certain parts of the program where we can watch to see if they're repeated often and they become hot. Um, those are places like function calls, but particularly any backward jump, because you can't have a loop without a backward jump in it. If those become hot, then that means that we're interested in that piece of code, so we want to pay attention to it. So what we do is we start tracing, and we record the white codes that we see. So basically, we start tracing, Record the bytecode, record its, its opcode and what grant it's got. Also record the values we see. So if, you, if you've got an add instruction, you've got a couple of inputs and outputs, record those as well. We keep going to a big long list and eventually we're going to have to stop tracing. Ideally we stop tracing when we get back to where we started and we found a loop. But other times what we found might be like something that leads into a loop or something that's an exception in or where it is we have to stop tracing. But we record these anyway. Um, and next time we see that part of the program, and this is the important bit, we already have this trace. Obviously, if we don't optimize it, it doesn't really achieve much. But even if we didn't optimize it at all, we could just still run those traces. And the program should relate to us, should. The program will execute in the same way. It won't actually be any more efficient in it if we optimize stuff. But these traces are a different way of sort of organizing the program. 
and they're an organizational program that's dynamic to actually reflect the program as it's running rather than just the way it was written. Um, if you look at these traces, the, the correspondence to the original program is very hard to follow and they look a bit strange, but they are actually what the virtual machine is doing. So, C5 and those things. Unfortunately, you can't just put tracing in it. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. So we need to modify it. And the first and most important thing we need to do is we need to separate the virtual machine from the hardware machine. Now, what does that mean? Obviously, it must run on the hardware, and it can't just be completely conceptual. What I mean by that is that the execution of the virtual machine doesn't need to be mirrored by the execution of the real machine. So a virtual machine makes calls internally. It's loads and loads of little calls, C functions to do this, C functions to do that. The Python you run makes calls as well. You know, you have a Python function, calls another Python function. But there's no reason why those two should be sort of intimately related. There's no reason why when you make a Python call, the virtual machine must make this call at the C level. And in fact, if you don't do that, if you can separate the two, your virtual machine becomes essentially an object obviously a lot of objects on the heap. And once you have simply you choose something as data, you can start manipulating it, and that gives you a lot of power. So um, the way we're going to do that in C Python is essentially break calls up into a pair part and a call part. Now with C Python invention, that Python calls are quite complicated. You know, at the fundamental level, what you do is that a call, you've got some parameters, some keyword parameters, some of those might be keyword only or parameters, whatever. Anyway, so you've got a bunch of arguments, and they get bundled up into two positional parameters and a dictionary, which is all your named arguments. And then you make a call, and then the other side of the call, it all gets unpacked again. So you've got this, you run up to the call, this arguments packed them together, jump the call, unpack them again. So it's quite a lot of work that goes on, and this sort of logical um, way to sort of organize things in the, in the C code is that you, you know, if you've got work to do, you make a call to keep your head, watch your code. But if you do the preparation of the call and then keep the actual call mechanism in Python in the interpreter, then it's just essentially a jump. You know, if you make a call at machine level, the assembler moves the stack frame to create a frame, that's pointed to make a frame, um, then the hardware pushes the return address onto some place and then jumps. And the virtual machine does the same thing. In Python, the, the, the frames have to go on the heap rather than in a, as a stack because we need introspection. You know, so the infamous sys.get frame and so it's the And just for the debug, so this is quite important. The point is, it makes the frame and then it pushes the return address and it jumps. Well, you can do that in the interpreter. So there's no reason why it has to be a jump of the C code. So to break that up, and the call is important thing is the call stays within the interpreter. So instead of each time you make a Python call, I'm going on about this one, I'm going to come to sleep. Um, so each time you make a call, and Python, it doesn't have to be a call at C level. Right. So we can now trace stuff. It's quite important that we need to manage these traces, otherwise we just use up more and more and more memory. And then it doesn't work. So basically, we're interested in running parts of the program that are hot, as I said, the ones that run often. This is a, a dynamic thing. You know, you, you might have a program that has a load up phase and then there's a main phase, and phase may change, especially if it's a, an interactive program. You may find you've got a block of code where you're doing some heavy operations and then the user does something different. So the bits you're interested in will change. So essentially, what you do is you keep a, a value that says how good is this piece of code, how hot it is, and every time trace is executed, we increment that, and then we have a time of base decrement. So every 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, we divide it by, you know, multiply by three quarters, I think, you know, some numbers up here. And T, you know, you, you test, you work out T experimentally. And the idea is that if the code hasn't been run for a bit, it just gets chucked away. And it, that means it makes room for new code. So as the, the program changes, you adapt to it. So, right, we've got our traces. As I said, it's not actually going to gain us anything. We need to optimize them. But the main thing we want to do with optimizing these traces is we want to kind of keep everything in the interpreter. Um, 
We want reportability, and also what we want is to be able to just plug these traces, put these optimizations in, test them independently, and more importantly, seeing as CPython is a system that's important to a lot of people that's used, we need to be able to add things incrementally, test it all works, you know, release stuff. So basically, we need to break these things down into sort of step by step. So we're looking at optimizations that we can do to, on the white code. Um, there's three important optimizations we're looking at. Specialization, escape analysis, I'll call it to third object allocation, you'll see why later, and compilation. Compilation, that's a machine code, but even without the compilation, you know, we're still going to get some speed ups, we'll see that later. Unfortunately, we can't trace the white code, which is a bit of a yeah, so it's not working too good at the moment. But there are ways around this, and quite, you can see how it works. And the reason is that Python bytecodes do a lot. You know, the semantic content of Python bytecode is big. And you take addition. Um, I presume everyone will know how addition works here, but I just want to anyway. If you're adding two values together, you call the methods the undub underscore add method on the left version. If that works, Fine, if it doesn't, you call double underscore right and on the right thing. Now, the problem with that is those methods are being implemented in Python, and you can interrupt their execution, either of them, which means you can observe the bytecode in a number of different states. So you can't record the bytecode because it's not an atomic entity, it's a compound thing. So we need to break these down. And we can't, so we can't record this trace because we can see the internal state of the interpreter. So we need to ask some bytecodes. These bytecodes are mainly used internally. This is quite important. So they don't affect the API. You don't see them if you disassemble stuff because you disassemble the functions, not traces. But internally, you need some lower level bytecodes. This doesn't actually add that much to the interpreter because we can compose our bigger bytecodes off these smaller ones. So it's, it's often it's just an occasion of refactoring a lot of stuff. Um, so they've got these bytecodes, but they're specialised forms of other bytecodes. So, for example, we might specialise forms for addition for integers and floating points. That actually pretty much integers and floating points, because that's what a machine does. Um, and then we've got bytecodes for directly calling C functions, which is very important because C Python has a lot of extensions. And the way the, you know, the, um, the standard library is all written in C, or pretty much all of this. Good chunk of it, anyway. Um, and these lower level bytecodes give us a building blocks for the Python semantics. So we can describe the higher level bytecodes in terms of these lower level bytecodes. And these lower level bytecodes we can presumably describe at a sort of sensible level that the, the um, semantics become so complicated that it's hard to follow. Um, so we need these building, block, uh, building blocks are things like looking up stuff in an object's dictionary, looking up stuff in a the, an object's types dictionary, um, or looking up stuff in a, a types dictionary, and this includes its, like, its superclasses. So, um, for example, if you look up an attribute on an object, you're looking, and it is in the dictionary, you're looking at dictionary, so that's kind of one of our primitives. If you look up an attribute on an object that's not in its dictionary, and it hasn't got a slot, then it'll defer to the class. And now it defers to the class, it defers to its superclass chain. So these are the kind of a, the fundamental building blocks of Python semantics, and, and you can pretty much describe the rest on top of it. Um, and there's some pretty odd little operations you need to do to do handle things like generators and such like that, um, as we'll see soon. So, we need a sort of abstract lower level machine, sort of below Python abstract machine. So I came up with this name. <laughs> sub Python abstract machine, or spam for short. Um, and so uh, let's describe SPAN. SPAN has lower level bytecodes than C Python, and all C bytecodes, C Python bytecodes, can be described in terms of SPAN instructions. That's very important because um, otherwise we have like, different implementations, it's very hard to match stuff up. Very important what we want to do is we want to describe the bytecode in terms of these SPAN instructions, and then use that to construct the bytecode implementation in the interpreter and use it in our tracing interpreter when we want to split it up. Um, for two different implementations, we're going to struggle with maintenance issues and such. So these are higher level hardware, as I said, because we include 
Um, things like, uh, well, including things like, as I say, the primitive operations that we had before, um, yeah, things like dictionary lookups and so on, these are much better, higher than hardware. Um, but there's some pretty low-level operations as well in there, integer addition and, and, and such things. So, um, so I've got some examples here. Yeah, so we've got load and stores in the objects dictionary, load from a class, and so the Python aware call primitive. So basically, it's, it's sort of call, like a C level call, but it is aware of the, um, the C API style of that it's going to be making the calls in. And this is the most important thing, or one of the most important things. So all spam instructions are atomic, um, which is why you get some pretty weird instructions, because it's quite easy to describe, you know, using more compact, uh, larger non atomic instructions, uh, the Python semantics. But to break it down stuff that cannot be, uh, essentially is indivisible, gets a little more complicated. Um, so, for example, the, the call bytecode seems fine, it makes a call. But it doesn't, because if you call an uh, object that's got a cooked up underscore call method not implemented on it, it actually looks that up. So it then goes through some other stuff, so it stays observable. So call itself isn't um, a primitive. We need for a primitive is something that says, is this a function? If so, do both a primitive call operation, or a built-in function, or a primitive function. Otherwise, you know, fetch its call attribute, and then try again. So there's a lot of sort of subtleties about a lot of Python white codes, um, but they can be brought, broken down into atomic operations, obviously, because otherwise it would be impossible to implement them. But it can be done so at a sensible level. Okay, so spam instructions. We've got low level operations, institution, floating point, addition, native caller, set. And these special operations support Python uh, semantics. So I'll, I'll explain how some of these work because they're a bit strange looking. So we've got load special or go to. That's a particularly weird instruction. Okay. Now, double underscore methods. Everyone knows that uh, double underscore add, addition, and so on. Um, these methods have, they're not in themselves privileged, but they're called in a special way in Python. If you stick a double underscore add um, in an object's dictionary, and I should say I'm talking about new style classes, or as you know, this is aimed at Python 3, which is all classes. This may not apply to Python 2 on style classes, which I know I try and avoid. Um, then if you call the, the add that's called on the type, it's a short circuit. Basically, instead of looking at the object's dictionary, you go straight to the type. And pull out his object's dictionary and then call that. Um, and that applies a whole bunch of things. Iterator, it calls it a double underscore iter, and a, as I said, there's addition and, and there's others. So this is kind of what we call our load special. Now, the load special all go to is because sometimes that attribute just isn't going to be there. So we don't want to be throwing exceptions in this sort of state because we're looking for some simple atomic bytecodes. We know also need to be able to raise exceptions, but that's sort of kind of a higher level. So hence what I go to. So basically, if I was that, that does, is it, it finds our special attribute, or if it's not there, it makes a branch. And for these sort of instructions, we can build up stuff. So a class of is obviously just grabs the type of something. It's a very, very simple primitive. From dictionary or go to, again, instead of going for the special attribute, that's the one that gets to have the object's dictionary, or goes to if it's not in the dictionary, or if it doesn't have a dictionary. And then I said swap exception state is a sort of funny little thing you need for generators. I won't bother with what it actually does. So, tracing and spam. So, we're starting our trace and we hit add instruction. It seems to be pervasive for this talk, just the add instruction. Anyway, so what we do is, well, we could just record these sort of our uh, spam instructions for the add. But unfortunately, that was going to produce big, big traces. In theory, should be optimizing back down to how they were before. But there's a, there's like a nice little shortcut. What we do is for special case things we recognize: integers, floating points, um, strings, tuples, lists. Um, and we'll just record the C Python bytecode because we know what that's going to do. It's not going to do anything unexpected on us. Um, so we can just optimize that simply. 
If, however, we see something we don't know, like say the, the decimal class. Decimal is written in Python, which means all its implementations of, of internally you know, it's Python code. So we, we need to then start tracing at the lower level. Um, so what we do is we trace a core to a function written in spam code that implements the add instruction. We can't just start tracing the code. Because if, we, if something un uh, unexpected happened, we'd be in an inconsistent state because we'd be sort of in the middle of the code, but there wouldn't be any follow-up. So we need to sort of insert a call into the code there to keep the sort of machine state consistent. Um, and we need spam equivalents for all of the C Python bytecodes. So there's one-to-one -one equivalents for simple stuff, like the stack operations. They're atomic, no problem. They are themselves spam instructions to start with. But obviously, as I say, things are more complicated. And we can give you some examples. So, load attribute. Load attribute, surprisingly, is rather simple. The reason it's simple is because all of the work is done somewhere else. So we've got load, or spe load special or go to get attribute. I guess our get attributes of out of for our object. Uh, if it fails, we go to something called impossible. The reason for that is that we know for a fact that every class has to get attribute because it's hardwired into objects. There's no way you might have. Name is a funny old thing. What it does is it takes the operand of the instruction stream, looks up the name in the current context, and shoves that name onto the stack. And then we call function. Call function, you'll know, is a C. Is a, is a C function bytecode. So we've actually implemented our one thing in another thing. So when we're tracing this, we see the call function. Um, if that get attribute is not a Python function, and in this case, oddly enough, it will be because we've implemented it in the lower level bytecode span. But if, suppose it weren't, then we'd have to do the whole thing of lower, putting another call into lower level. So. Anyway, so uh, this dispatches the object get attribute at the, usually. Um, Python does this this in C, um, which means it has its implemented as a call, which means it's you know it adds a, a C call, which means it's very hard to optimize. So we need to kind of expose the internals of this stuff to, to the optimizers in the virtual machine. So obviously C code as I say is in paper can't be optimized, spam code can be. So um, so that's, that was an equivalent. That was one where we could actually just, right, I should go back here. Right, in this case, now this, this is interesting. These can't, because these can't fail, um, we can trace them in line. We don't need to insert a call because we know we'll get to the end of this and things are stable and consistent. But some things, um, such as binary subscript, can potentially fail. I'm not sure why. Oh yeah, the reason is because we have to, we make, we, uh, no, there's no actual reason why this is in the function. Oh yeah, okay. The binary subscript is my example there. Yeah, this is why I should have notes in this talk. Uh, and this again is a case where we, we substitute these three instructions in. When we make the call, however, uh, the binary subscript, ah, right, okay. Binary subscript cannot be implemented in line. But we have a two-level thing where we actually have to implement a bit in line to actually call our surrogate function. So we've got this function binary subscript function, which we call. We have to the rotate three is just to tidy up the arguments from the order that come in. So we get something like this. Um, this does what you'd expect. In other words, it calls the get item underscore get item function or method. Right, so we, we load the frame, that's our value, we, we do our go to or special, and this does the, um, the, the Python semantics, so giving us the right error message if we fail. Um, the bit at the bottom sorts out the error message, you won't worry about that too much. Then our load frame one, our load frame is when you load fast, which is the thing that that frame, but in this context we know it can't fail, so our load frame is a slightly optimized version of that that doesn't need, uh, need no checking. We then call function, which again may get expanded or whatever, return the call, and then there's a return value. Right, I should say anything in capitals is actually a standard C Python bytecode. Anything in lowercase is a, a spam instruction, but I don't know if that was clear, probably not, but it is now. So, right. And so I haven't gone through this elaborate procedure to actually get some traces. 
We now have traces that are somewhere between the machine level and the Python level. Uh, I would say they're high level in the pipeline, but not necessarily that much more so. Right, then we need to optimize these codes, because if we leave it as it is now, it's almost certainly going to be slower than when we started, because we've added a lot of code, uh, extra instructions in. The instructions are smaller and faster, so the speed loss isn't as great as you might expect from the amount of stuff we seem to have added, but nonetheless it will be slower. But what it has done is exposed a lot of optim optimization potential, I mean a lot. So we've got three main optimizations we can do. Specialization. Um, well, actually, before I start these optimizations, I'll mention something about the order. This order is important. Basically, the further you go down this list, the bigger the effect each of these optimizations has. But without the ones above it, they're completely useless. Um, and this is essentially the, the problem that um, Unlaid and Swallow has, is that it's not made doing enough work to transform the code before it enters the compilation. So they're really struggling to get any sort of speed ups. Um, without these sort of transformations, Python bytecode just isn't a middle to speed up. And as PyPy clearly shows, with these transformations, it most definitely is. So, specialization is the first. Uh, well, we've got a chain here. So basically, yeah, so we're arranging with the chain. And the important thing to note is that we start off with a bytecode trace. We go through a specializer, and we have a bytecode trace. We go through further off the cleanup, and we have a bytecode trace. And well, there's a cleanup phase before we compile. Basically, each of these takes the same input as its it format, as its input as an output, and it's always executable. Which means as we have stages, we can run the whole test suite, whatever, through it, and it should all work. If we just start playing around with individual phases, they should work. Performance may be horrible things, but everything should work. Um, and that's quite useful because, as I see by this production system, People get upset, we go and test things, and then release them. So, specialization. Right. Specialization is the customization of types for the expected, of the trace for the expected types. And we've already done some customization. The tracing is customized for our flow control. Um, we've customized for the expected function when we see a call. We've customized for whether we took a true or false branch in a, an if statement. So this is a, a bit more customization. Essentially what the, gate, the aim of this all is, is that a lot of code has, well, Python has an enormous number of dynamic features. Everything you do, there's potential dynamism in every little operation and in every little sub-operation within those operations. Yet, even the most dynamic program uses dynamism to interesting degrees. You know, they are, for 99% of those things, not dynamic, because there's so many possibilities. The beauty of Python is that you can, you can use those anywhere in the program, all sorts of clever stuff. But generally, a good Python program will have some clever thing and some nice framework we'll put away somewhere, and then the rest of it will be nice, sensible, clean code. Sensible, clean code tends to do what you expect. What you expect is tends to be the same, similar things time after time. In other words, it's a bit, obviously it's going to do different things in terms of the data, but its behavior will be broadly similar. So we exploit that. Um, so we customize heavily. So the first thing is that tracing, which customizes flow control. The second thing is tracing for the types. So for each byte code, as we go through the trace, and this is how the optimizations work, we've got a big long trace, we start at the top, we just work our way around, straight through linear paths, which means they're simple and fast. Um, the simple is probably more important in this case, because, as I say, these things need to be right. Um, so what we do is we ensure the type of the objects is as we expected. And what we do there is basically we look up our recorded type information, and if it doesn't match the type that we record, the expected type we're recording from tracing, we insert some extra code somewhere to ensure that it does match. Um, then we replace the bytecode with something with a faster equivalent, or we don't, but hopefully we do. Some, well, some instructions we end up not being placed with a faster equivalent, but we then rely on later optimization stages. Some things aren't customizable, because there is, they're already you know, essentially well typed anyway. Um, Give you an example. I mean, like just a stack manipulation instruction. You don't, you can't improve that with specialization. So a lot of instructions just get replaced, left in place. But that's just the cheap ones. 
ones we improve are the expensive ones, and that's really a big thing. And then we update our type information so that our type information gets more and more specific as we go down through the trace. And that's very important in loops because uh, when we go back to the top of the loop, we have more specific type information and we start unrolling the loop so that we basically are in our loop, we should have really well optimized code. So, as I say, we, we, and the way we ensure our types is that we have guards. Uh, the two types of guards, which I'll come to in the next slide, but basically, a guard is a piece of code somewhere that ensures things are as we expect. And then we replace them, sorry, by code with fast ones. So, in the, the uh, ubiquitous binary addition example, Suppose we expect the two integers, we've ensured that they are two integers, we can now replace the binary addition with an integer add, which has changed its name from I add. Uh, yeah, question? So what do you guys do if it turns out that it's not that's what we do? What will you do if it turns out the type is not as expected? I think it's on the next slide, but briefly, briefly the answer is they leave the trace. So the, the simple answer is that they just go back to interpreting the code as it was before. The slightly more complicated answer is that they actually monitor if they themselves merit a new trace, if they do, they start recording a new one. Uh, and that's, that's, yeah, these optimizations add more guards and then they actually rely back on the trace caching mechanism <coughs> to build up these sort of flow controls. So, um, the specialized version, when you have the specializing in it, you actually see that the shape of the sort of graph of traces changes from if you just had plain tracing. Guards. So, we've got two types of guards, inline guards and outline guards. Now, outline guards are a bit more complex, but they're cheaper, so we want to use them where possible. Inline guards are very simple. It's just a simple test to say, are things as we expect? So, in our integer addition example, we've got two values on the stack, and we don't know what they are. So, we need to insert some uh, bytecode or two to check that they're integers. So, basically, we have a thing that says, is the type of the object on the stack what we're expecting if it is an exit of trace? Uh, and, and then another one that just does that for the second variable on the stack in order to support binary operators. So we have to insert a couple of extra instructions. As the line guards are a bit more complex, in that almost any sort of significant state change that can happen in Python must be done through a call to a function somewhere. Um, not at the Python level necessarily, but at the virtual machine level. So if you change the attribute on a type, that is the sort of thing that's going to upset your optimizations. But you can put the code to protect your optimizations in the actual type class where the, the, the thing itself has changed. Because types get, that attribute and types get changed really, this is actually has real, little real cost. But it does, what it does mean is you don't have to put these guards in your loops in your really tight pot. So essentially, you're removing, you're taking a fairly cheap piece of code that could potentially be optimized billions of times and turning it into a piece of code which is hundreds of times more expensive, which, which will probably never be run. So it's a matter of how expensive it is. Um, so an example I've got here is so we're guarded against the type attribute change, uh, attribute change, and we add that code to type double underscore stack attribute because that's the only place where um, the code can be changed. So, attributes on classes can be changed. Um, right, so that's specialization. So we now have a trace, and it's now specialized. That means things like addition have been changed to uh, integer addition. Um, and things like looking up attributes will be changed to like slightly more or more optimized versions. Uh, I'll explain how that works if we have time later on. That's the probably optional extras. I don't have to time for much. Um, but there's still a lot of um, work done that's not really easily done. A classic example is function calls. Now, as I said earlier, conceptually a Python function call consists of binding stuff into a tuple. I'm going to into a dictionary, calling a function, and then unpacking and basically undoing all that work you've just done. C Python has a few sort of um, small scale optimizations to sort of reduce the cost of that, but the problem with those sort of optimizations is that they themselves have a cost, so they don't really get rid of the cost, they just kind of reduce it a bit in the common case and make it a bit more expensive than other cases. It helps, but it's not, not really a cure. However, in a trace, 
We know what happens before and after call because it's in the same trace. And that is where we have a lot of opportunity to get rid of stuff. So, the way we do it, because we want a linear pass through, is basically whenever we see code that creates an object, we don't create it. We just pretend we create it. So we, call, we retain a sort of shadow stack or shadow stacks of things that we would have created that maintains the state of the execution stack as it would be. And we keep running that, and then if it turns out that we actually need those objects, because we're calling some function that's outside our trace, or we're returning from the trace, that's pretty much it really, then we create those objects. But often that won't happen. Or, so generally what will happen is that an object will be created, we'll use bits out of it, and then we won't need it anymore, and then the trace will exit, at which point we don't need to worry about it because it's gone. So, uh, as I said, right. so uh, we maintain the shadow stacks, we've got three shadow stacks. Data stack, which is where a normal execution happens, you add stuff, takes two values of the stack, there's one back, so we do that virtually. Frame stack, that's when you call a function, it creates a frame. And uh, exception handling stack, which I won't be worried about this talk. Um, and yeah, so when we, when we need to create an object, we do so. So I'll give you a quick example. So we're calling a function. So um, every iterator has an iter underscore, a double underscore iter method, which just returns itself. So the top one is the Python code for it, and that's an example of being called. Uh, so, so we start tracing, and as I said earlier, it's not entirely obvious how, why I just, how that, the bottom line, turns into that. But if you follow it, you, you load x, and then there's a load special iter, because we have x.iter. Then we build the parameters. We don't have any parameters, but build parameters to create an empty tuple, an empty dictionary. Uh, then we've got the prepare bound method call, which basically unpacks our bound method and reassembles stuff, taking the, the self out of the bound method, sticking it in front of the tuple, and pulling the function out of the bound method. So again, there's a lot of work and shuffling going. Then we need, this is a guard, a function check, it checks that the function we actually see is the function we expect, because otherwise this is going to be complete nonsense at this point. Um, then we have to make a frame, then we initialize it, initialize the frame from the tuple in the dictionary um, on the stack, or function is also on the stack, so it gives the information we need to initialize the frame. Then we eventually actually load our value itself and then return. So, load. Our specialization, well first of all I'll go through how the specializer works on this. So most, uh, specialization uh, will get rid of some of this code. So that load special iter we can get rid of because um, we ensure, in, in some of the to ensure that we know the type of x, chances are this code is embedded in more code than we already know the type of x. Then we can have an out of line guard to ensure that we don't redefine iter. And then we have a place where we have a bind instruction to create the bound method. So the bind instruction just takes two objects and bundles them up. Bad build parameters, as I say, there's nothing we can do about that in specialization. Likewise, bound uh, a few of these. Function tech 2, due to the guards we inserted earlier, we know what the function is, so we can remove that. And load fast at the bottom, we can replace with load frame because we know that self is defined because it's a parameter, so it can't possibly be undefined. You don't normally know that in Python because you don't quite know what's what do you do, so it depends. But anyway, in this case, because traces are now much more simple to optimize, uh, analyze, we definitely do. So here's a specialized output. It's not only really any shorter, but it's a little bit quicker because we've replaced a couple of things with a slightly cheaper version. The ensure type is just a simple check, the binds are doing a fairly simple thing, but it doesn't create an object, so it still has a significant cost. So, yep. I don't remember it with parameters, main frame, main frame. Yeah, you're right, they should be in lowercase. Uh, it's quite out, the main frame and main frame should be lowercase because they're, um, they're, the thing is, I generate this example using hotpy, uh, and then I kind of manually fix it up to look like C point, both those are not going to make a couple of mistakes here. But essentially, this is what the trace would look like if you ignore the case. Same to Windows. Um, <laughs> So, the specializer makes the trace faster, but it doesn't make much difference to the number of bytes in this contrived example. Uh, 
the specialized body cavities are faster than the ones they replace. So it, it, it helps. However, deferred object creation is where we get a big win here. So our load fast. So what do we do with the load fast? Well, we can defer the load because we know that. Uh, um, so I keep getting longer and longer time because it's gone up from minus 15 to minus 5. So I must have more time now. Um, anyway, <laughs> so we deferred load, so we, we push, push our value to the data stack. Then we've got bind, where we pop our value from the data stack, and then we push this bound method back to the data stack. So we just still haven't done anything yet, which is the data stack now has a bound method on it. Then build parameters, or we push an empty tube and an empty dictionary to the shadow stack. Do I haven't done anything. Then create a bound method call. Well, as I said, this does this funny thing where it pulls about the bound method and reshuffles the, the tuple stuff. So initially we have a bound method, an empty tuple, and an empty dictionary. We reshuffle those into the function, uh, a tuple of a one parameter, and an empty dictionary. Then we make, well, we've done on the shadow stack. Then make frame. We'll have a look at the, the uh, call on the data stack and we push a new frame to the shadow stack. You'll note we still haven't actually written any instructions. So we need the frame. So we pop all the three values off the data stack. We initialize the shadow frame from the values. And then well, our new shadow frame, so if we now have no value on the data stack, our shadow frame has the, our deferred local variable, zero, is equal to the actual local variable because we haven't created the frame. So that's the real local variable in the real frame as it currently exists. And then a load fast. Well, that, Calls the value out of the local, which is the deferred local zero, which is actually the local two, and we push local two onto our shadow stack. We still haven't given any instructions. And then pop frame, I think it was returning. The returning basically just pop frame and then a jump. So we pop the frame, or we discover the deferred frame, so we never really needed that. And so far, so we've actually not actually emitted any code whatsoever. <laughs> However, the trace presumably is going to end at some point, in which case we must materialize our stacks. Well, we've got nothing on the, um, the frame stack, so we don't have to do anything for that. But what have we got on the, uh, the, the, the third stack? Well, we've got one local variable, so we have to make one bytecode, one fast bytecode to push our value back. So we've converted nine bytecodes down to one. Now, as I said, this is a clearly contrived example. But, you know, this, this Python does have to do this sort of work when it does call, when it calls functions. Um, and yeah, so this, this makes a big difference. So you can remove 50% of the, the bytecodes commonly, or 50% or more in this sort of optimization. Right. Now, there's a couple of bits of ideas here I haven't shown you, which is how it handles um, mixed um, values where some are deferred and not, some are not deferred. So, what it does is it maintains its red local cache and pushes non deferred values into the cache that so can then pretend they're deferred because the deferred values are low. So it produces a lot of sort of churning of small stuff, so we need a clean up phase to tidy it up, but this is really not, not particularly important. And finally, you're wondering if it ever gets compilation, sure. Here it is. Once we've done all this stuff, then now is the time we can look at compiling code. And in fact, even to be honest, if we don't bother compiling code, we can still expect significant speed ups from pure interpreter. But, having gone this far, we might as well go the whole the way. So, we had a third level of hotness. Now, previously we had cold, which is where it shuts it away, warm, which is where it the cache, and hot, which is actually where it makes the effort to actually compile to machine code. Now, we assume, we're going to assume that compliance to machine code takes a fair bit of work, so we're going to be a bit more reluctant to do that than our previous optimizations, which are all straightforward linear passes, and that's quite quick. So, we translate the trace into machine code. We need extra optimization we need to do? Well, we need to do register allocation stuff that compilers do. But that's it, because all of our interesting Python dynamic language specific stuff, we've already done it. So essentially, what we're compiling is the sort of thing that standard off the shelf compilers like. Uh, so when I say standard translation to machine code is straightforward, it isn't if you write your own compiler. But if you use someone else's, well, yes, it's fairly straightforward. We've got LLVM, LibJIT, NanoJIT. Roll your own, really, if you can be bothered, but use one of those. Um, and there's a, uh, what's, the, what's the GNU one? Anyway, there are other possibilities. Right, well, having gone through this, how much faster is it going to be? Well, to be honest, I haven't done this, so I don't know, but <laughs> I did implement HotPy, and I did do a lot of experiments on that. And the design, the, um, 
Hot clay, the significant difference in design of hot clay is it's got a better garbage collector. But otherwise, this sort of design, high level by code, tracing at slightly lower level, specialization, third observation, compilation, is the same. So the results should pretty much stand. And this sort of thing, you know, you're a bit hand lazy with things anyway. But so, I mean, it depends how much fast it's going to go. You know, if you're running a web server and you're spending all your time rummaging around, waiting for caches and internet connections and so on, I mean, it doesn't make a difference. Um, so the stuff where you're actually working the virtual machine, computational code, then, yeah, we, these are very, very hand wavy numbers. But you, you, I reckon you're looking for a speed up with a pure interpreter about three times and with a compiler about ten times. Now, I know Python actually can drive a speed up with 450 the other day on some code, but uh, in more generally, you don't expect that sort of stuff. But web style of stuff, uh, I haven't got a clue. I don't really know the, the nature of the algorithms or anything they use. So, I don't have any time left, so I'll, I'll skip these other issues if the time is available. And uh, thank you for listening. And are there any questions? Yes, I was wondering if you, if you have all these traces, um, then if a machine looks at every instruction to see if probably trace applies, right? And executes the trace. No. How does that work? Can you explain well, that? trace is going to only start on backward edges or function calls, so you only look for those. So they have something like uh, a smaller fraction of the code. Um, and if you're seeing the function often, then you'll be running up a trace, so you won't be doing the looking. And if you're not seeing often, it doesn't matter. So how, how do you uh, select the trace? Because I understood from your, from your talk that if there is a certain point, then there might be two, three, four, or ten traces, depending on the type of
Uh, yeah, the, the, the normal stuff here is the way of actually getting it to work in, in C Python. So, um, but the thing is, set, write your code sensibly. Don't do anything that. I mean, yeah, just write, write the code, don't worry about it. It should be the way it works because um, the point of these optimizations is that although they do rely on certain sort of behavior to work at their very best, almost no program will be so pathological that it, it, it perverts all of the optimizations. So even though it's not working a fair bit of the time, you'll still get some benefits, and those benefits will outweigh the slight extra cost of doing it. You should pretty much, I don't, I don't really see how you can get a slowdown for this. Um, I mean, you can analyze how it's constructed and write a program to defeat it, but with that exception, I don't see how it's going to <laughs> Uh, okay, so I ran a little late, um, so I apologise if this is a stupid question. Uh, and aside from being late, it's mostly over my head. But um, was the whole talk sort of quite theoretical, or do you have a set of tools to implement this stuff? And if yes, can you describe the practical steps? So, like, I've got a program, I think it's a bit slow, I want to use mark technique to, to speed it up, so I want to do some run on my tests via a special command line, it's going to produce that, then I run minus minus specialized, minus minus compile. And it gives me some new files or what, and then can I run them? Right. If you have a um, pre existing um, virtual machine for a dynamic language, then this technique probably is the best. If you, don't, if you, have, you want to make a virtual machine for a dynamic language, use PyPy. Um, that's it, pretty much. Yeah, this is, this is deliberately. This is an engineering problem with how to do this in C Python. It has no what problem that we can up from that. But I think it's an important enough thing to this merit merit the effort. Hi. Is there a place uh, where to uh, get access to your work uh, somewhere, uh, like a public repository? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's all there. Basically, Hot Pie is built by, with a toolkit that I do, it's a major part of my, uh, my PhD. Uh, if you go to learn uh, addresses or search for that, you should find my university website, and it's stuff on Google Code, it's all on Google Code. So. Okay, and uh, another small question. Uh, is your work being uh, accepted in the, into the mainstream C Python uh, development branch? Uh, is it? No, this is part of the exercise in convincing people that all the time. Have you actually spoken to the C Python developers? Like, yeah, any, 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 any I can nail down for more than a few minutes to, to talk to, yes. <laughs> there aren't many, there aren't many here, at least uh, I'm not really sure who I should be talking to, I've not done more problems with that. Because it really seems to be a very sensible approach to something that has uh, much greater likelihood of being accepted compared to say, a swallow when it used to still be active. And when can it get, when can it happen? Like, well, actually, if you, I'm um, kind of, for writing formal documents and such for it at the moment, but um, unfortunately, there's a little bit more to the uh, modification to C Python than I kind of uh, admit to in the talk. Most, most of those are like fairly minor details, and most of them would be beneficial anyway. They're just sort of cleaning out the code and a bit of refactoring here and there. Um, so I don't really see a problem with those. Uh, it's just Thing is, I think if you're a responsible developer of something that as many people rely on as Python, you should be very conservative. So, I, and then I think I'm going to be conservative. So, it's going to. Yeah, this needs to be pretty solid and tested by them and be you know, done in a convincing way if I'm going to think about it again. Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry guys, uh, we've finished our time. Uh, thank you very much, Mark.